Fine. Let's see what we have left here. Ah. Now, when, um, when I know this concept of, of risk neutral pricing and making the, the stock price or whatever is traded martingales when discounted, then it turns out that you can also easily get the, the uh, partial differential equation that has to be solved to price your option. It took us a little bit of time to get the partial differential equation uh, by doing it the way Black, Scholes and Merton did it, by the replication argument. But here, if you, if you know about the Martingale property, now, uh, which they didn't use, uh, we can actually get it in a, in a more efficient way. So let me show you that. I, it can be useful if you have a, a new model, a different model with brown motion, and you cannot remember how to write down the, or you don't know how to write down the partial differential equations. Maybe this is your job interview as a quant and somebody asks you to do this, or you are interviewing somebody, you can ask them, now oh, here is the model, and you write something which is maybe different from Black Scholes, and you tell them, well, write, me the, write down the partial differential equation uh, to, to, for the price of, this, for, of, of an option in this model. So here is a, here's a straightforward way to do it. Okay, the option price is going to be a function of T and S of T if you are talking about uh, European path independent payoffs. And I'm going to use Ito's rule on the option price, but under WQ, which means it's going to look exactly the same as Ito's rule under W, under P, except I'm going to replace mu by r and I'm going to write w superscript q instead of w. Okay, we had this already. That was how we started deriving the Black-Scholes partial differential equation. But it, this is just theta zero. Right? It's first derivative with respect to time plus first derivative with respect to stock times the drift, which is now rs under q, plus second derivative with respect to stock times one half sigma squared s squared volatility times s squared and then this is the same as before first derivative times sigma s dw q in this case yeah? so this is eta zero and i know that this when i discount it has to be a martingale which means it has to have dt term equal to zero so let's discount it if i discount it and look at the dynamics I already told you what's happening you can check by e to the rule on the product but you multiply everything by e to the minus rt and then you add minus rc here you get the term minus rc that's the only difference plus something the wq this has to be a martingale and this is replicable this can be replicated by uh, by a wealth process, which when discounted is a martingale, so this has to be a martingale, which means this has to be zero. If you write this to be zero for every s and every t, that's exactly your partial differential equation, Black Scholes Merton type. Yeah? You put this equal to zero, this dt term, that's exactly the partial differential equation we derived before. For, for prices of options in the Black Scholes model, for you know, prices of European type uh, path independent options. Yeah? So th this is, uh, this was easy if you know it as rule and you know that the discounted the price has to be a martingale under the pricing probability, you get a partial differential equation in, you know, in two steps. Okay, so that's sometimes useful to know. Okay, here's a slide which I don't need right now, but I will need it later as a motivation for going beyond the Black Scholes Merton model. I, I'm still going to stay in the Black Scholes Merton model for a, for a few slides, uh, but then after that we are going to 
do stochastic, discuss stochastic volatility models. What are stochastic volatility models? Stochastic volatility models are models in which you don't assume that sigma is constant. Instead, you assume that sigma randomly changes with time. The volatility randomly changes with time. Why? That was histori historically, I was going to say hysterically, it was historically the first extension of the black scholes method model, and it's kind of natural because if you think about it, there's only two parameters here that drive the option price in this model, only two model parameters, R, the interest rate, and sigma. Now, R, whether it's random or not, if you're pricing stock options, it's not going to change much your numbers. So really, it's sigma, if you are talking about stock options on stocks, it's really sigma that drives everything. And uh, yeah, for, for a while, uh, you know, the Black Scholes model, everybody was using it, looked okay, but then 1987 crash happened and people realized maybe we need uh, more realistic models. So it was natural for them to think, okay, maybe sigma is not constant. Let's, let's uh, look at uh, models which, which are different in terms of modeling sigma. And this slide shows you this concept of implied volatility and how you can, in fact, from the data, from market option price data, how you can conclude that uh, the, Black Show, the market is not really pricing options using the Black Shows model. So what is implied volatility? Implied volatility is the value of sigma that you choose so that the theoretical Black Scholes price of the option is equal to the observed market price of the option. Okay? So in other words, if I if I denote by um, let me get the pen here. If I denote by let's say B S M Black Scholes Merton function as a function of sigma then sigma implied, I'm going to put IMP here for implied, is chosen so that this is equal to the market price of the option. Okay. Uh, for Let's say for call options, <coughs> if you move sigma from zero to infinity, you will get any possible uh, no arbitrage option price uh, for calls. Therefore, there, and uh, there will be a, there will exist exactly one for which you you, you get a, uh, whatever value, let's say uh, whatever the market price is. You can find one, which is called implied volatility. You can find one volatility value for which your theoretical price from the Black Scholes model is equal to the market price. Okay? That's called implied volatility. Volatility implied from the market prices, if Black Scholes model was correct. Yeah. to make the theoretical price equal to the market price. Now, look at the following graph. Suppose I put, I look at single stock, maybe Google or whatever, or S&P 500 index. I look at a single asset and I look at several options on the same asset with different strike prices. And then I find implied volatility for every option like that. Okay? For different strike prices, uh, I find uh, uh, implied volatility for all of them. If the Black Scholes model was correct, how should this graph look like? Yeah, that's a question for you. Okay, think about it. Uh, I have single stock and I change the strike price of options and then I find volatility which makes the theoretical price equal to the market price. If the Black Scholes Merton model was correct in the sense that the market is using it for pricing these options, then that should be the same sigma implied, implied volatility should be the same for every strike price, because it doesn't matter what the strike price is for the model, the model is modeling the stock, not options. Sigma, there's only one sigma in the model for one stock. Okay, so it should really be a flat, 
uh, flat uh, uh, curve, it should be you know, something like this. But typically, when you look at the market data, it's not like that. It's it's more cur it's curved like this. Okay, it you will only have discretely many points because you have only finitely many strike prices. But um, okay, if I present it as a curve, it would look something like this. This would be called a volatility smile. Uh, you ha you may have different shapes for different assets. Okay, uh, w which means that relative to the black black shoals the market is using higher uh, okay higher sigma higher volatility actually turns out to result in a higher price for call and put options okay, so higher price higher volatility means higher prices of the options so if you have a graph like this that means that the market is using higher prices for pricing options uh, with extreme uh, la extremely large or extremely small strike prices relative to uh, the middle values of strike prices okay so th this is cheaper than this or here especially here okay so so it seems like the markets even if it's using black shows it's actually applying different volatility to different strike prices, which theoretically doesn't make sense because it's not consistent theoretically because there should be only one sigma for one stock. Um, but uh, that's not what's happening. So it seems like the market is uh, more careful and more, uh, uh, you know, it charges higher prices for extreme events, okay, for, for uh, for the stock, uh, <coughs> for for, for uh, the stocks which are very much out of the money or very much in in the money, and then you have to worry about probability of extreme events. Strictly speaking, you don't have to worry about those probabilities if you have a complete market, because then you don't care about the actual probabilities, but only about risk-neutral probabilities. But uh, in in reality, you cannot hedge perfectly, and maybe you do worry about uh, those events, and maybe Black Shores model, uh, Black Shores Merton model, is simply not uh, what you believe in. Uh, so you you don't really price by Black Shores. Okay. So this is going to be a motivation for us to introduce stochastic volatility and other models later on. Well, we're not going to discuss them very much, but only but a little bit. Fine, that, that's it, what we did in this set of, of slides. We learned how to price any at least path-independent option, European path-independent option in the Black Shores model, because we know how the stock price Actually, even for path-dependent options, you can do simulation of those expected values. We know how the dynamics of the stock price look under the risk-neutral pricing probability. You just replace mu by r, and then you compute expected values. Okay.